Hey everybody, Oli here. Welcome to the weekly news recap the 20th to the 26th of May 2024. Okay, get into it. So, this week, uh, Shadow of the Erd Tree dropped a lore trailer. <laughs> May, uh, it didn't make sense, as is tradition in From Software. This makes no sense whatsoever, um, but it looks good. Uh, no gameplay. Um, no gameplay in the trailer. But, again, this is DLC to Elden Ring, so the gameplay is going to be more or less the same. It's not showing too much here. Potentially it's showing off a little bit of the, um... Say... The origins of the Lands Between. How they came to create the Erd Tree and... Uh... Everything that uh, befell the land afterwards, uh, the lands that were caught in the shadow of the Urge Tree, which is what the DLC is called, were fared not particularly great. They seem to go out of their way to kill those guys a lot, really, really hard. Uh, led by this dude, where is he? Skip past him. Anyway, led by Mesmer, who is kind of the poster boy for this DLC. Whether he'll actually be the final boss or not, it's not clear, but he's going to be a significant. Um, person, at least. Um, then some things about Mikola, it's DLC is kind of really about. Uh, Mikola is one of the only, one of the only children of Radagon and Marika um, that we didn't meet in the core game, in the base game. So they're kind of important, somewhat. Well, not somewhat, they're very important. <laughs> we really should have met them in the base game, but anyway. Uh, yeah, just, just lore, just lore things. Nothing about, you know, but you can kind of picture some of the creatures and some of the people we might be meeting along the way in the DLC. Anyway, uh, release date hasn't changed, 21st of June, it's coming up pretty soon, as you can probably guess with so many games coming out before it. Um, as they know, it's about to eat all of their lunches. Anyway, outside of that, uh, there was an indie, uh, it was like an indie expo for some indie games. Um, there's not a ton of news out of it. It's mostly just reiterating games that are already on their way out. Or some of them have been delayed, like Blade Chimera here, which we're taking a look at. This is the first kind of gameplay uh, look we've had of Blade Chimera. The last trailer we got was very kind of quick cuts and edits, so we didn't really get a decent appreciation for how the game is going to play. But as you can see, it's kind of a slower paced Metroidvania type thing. Um, hey, you getting on? Can't read that name. Hey, it's Minty. Um, and you can play as a Shiba as well. Stealth gameplay with Shiba Inu. Anyway, uh, this has been delayed. It's been delayed out to August instead. It was going to be coming out actually fairly soon, but um, I don't know, they decided to delay it um, along with a couple of other games that have had been the delay as well in the indie stuff. Hey Melman, how you getting on? Uh, but Blade Chimera, you are playing, I don't know, Sephiroth, basically, and you have um, the sword from, not Twilight Princess, what's the one? What's the one with the sword, Phantom Hourglass? That's the one with the sword that talks to you? Fuck, I don't remember which Legend of Zelda that is, but it's effectively that. Anyway, it's quite pretty, um, and as you know, I like to play games where you walk to the side and hit things really hard. Anyway, August at some point, we don't know when. Moving on. And we have mouthwashing. So mouthwashing was uh, a demo that we played during Steam Next Fest. As, as some Zelda, it's one of the Zeldas. I just don't remember which one. I don't remember if I played this one on stream. I don't think I did. Anyway, mouthwashing is kind of like the film Sunshine a little bit, in that you're you're in space. Um, some things have gone wrong. And, you know, horror shenanigans are about to transpire. Um, and the mouthwashing, I won't give away why it's called mouthwashing, just play the demo and find out. Um, but it's really good. Uh, the demo was... Um, how do you say it? The demo was exclusive, I guess, to Steam Next Fest for a while. So it disappeared, but it's back in now as just anybody can play it. And I would encourage you, it's a horror game, don't, you know... <laughs> do keep that in mind, but it was good. I thought it was really good. Um, unfortunately, there's still no release date for mouthwashing, which is 
annoying because I want to know when it's coming out because I thought it was really good. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Hotel Barcelona. Hotel Barcelona is a joint game between uh, Suda51 and Swery another number. I don't remember what. Not 69. That's too funny. It wouldn't be that. Anyway, Swery and Suda are kind of niche, kind of uh, cult heroes in, in Japanese video games. They make very strange games. Um... Suda tends to go for kind of bombastic stuff, so you might know Lollipop Chainsaw, Shadows of the Damned, that's all him, and Swery kind of goes for more just really weird um, pop culture stuff, so Deadly Premonition is probably the game he's known best for. Anyway, this is a game where the two of them have joined up, so we're going to get most of Suda's sort of gameplay, this kind of really gory, just high impact kind of stuff, and combine it with Swery's just general weirdness <laughs> like get something interesting out of it um the gist of hotel barcelona as you can see it's kind of a metroidvania yeah castlevania type thing um but the idea of it is the hotel is full of uh serial killers from the past and you need to deal with them essentially if you want to survive uh again no release date it's just it's this year at some point but it would be nice to know when Anyway, moving on. Kingdom Hearts is finally all in one place, almost, with just one game uh, as an exception. So the Kingdom Hearts series has made its way over to Steam. It's no longer locked into the Epic Games salt mines. Uh, as you can buy them as kind of a bunch of um, bundles. So the Kingdom Hearts 1.5, 2.5 is Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, and the games that are set in between the two of them. Oh, these have the weirdest fucking names. Chain of Memories, 358 Half Days, Birth by Sleep, and Recoded. Some of these are just cinematics because they're DS games and they wouldn't... They didn't translate properly, so they didn't bother translating the gameplay. They just translated the, the cinematics. Reported the cinematics, rather. 2.8 Final Chapter Prologue, of course. Dream Drop Distance, Birth by Sleep, uh, Kingdom Hearts G back cover. Like, there's got such... Kingdom Hearts series has must have the weirdest um, naming conventions. And then Kingdom Hearts 3 uh, with the DLC with it. So it's not quite all the games. There's two games are missing. Kingdom Hearts Chi, which is a mobile game, and it's nobody's been able to play it uh, outside of Japan. And it was discontinued. So really nobody can play it at this point, um, which is annoying because it's actually really important for the story of the game. <laughs> it sets up the whole fucking series. And it was a mobile game that now nobody can play. This is extremely frustrating. Anyway, and then Kingdom Hearts Melody of Memories, which is a rhythm action game. That's still uh, exclusive to the Epic Game Store, but I imagine it will make its way over to Steam at some point. So that's good. It's all in one place. And then game preservation wise, it's not locked into any particular launcher. So all good things there. I will get around to the Kingdom Hearts series on stream at some point because I do like it a lot. And there are quite a few of those games that I have not played because they were locked to the DS or, you know, locked to a mobile fucking game in a different territory that I had no chance of ever playing. So, we'll get around to it at some point. Okay, Sims Contender Life by You is delayed again. This time forever, possibly. Anyway, this game has been delayed a grand total of three times in the past. It was supposed to be out May of last year to early access um, and has gradually just been delayed, delayed, delayed. So, this is not, it's not looking good. That's not, these aren't, this isn't great news for the game. Uh, developers are reluctant to set a new date, which, I mean, if you've had to delay it three times already, understandable, but also a little concerning that you didn't do that ahead of time. And even then, it's still only going to be released into early access, so even when they do set a date for it, there's still a lot of work left on the game. After much consideration, we regret to announce that we have decided to retract life by user early access release date previously set for June 4th. Um, it was previously set for way ahead of that as well. Announced in March of last year, the game was originally set to launch in oh, sorry, September 2023, but has then been delayed into March and then into June, and then it's been delayed once again. Looked like an old Sims game, but boring. <laughs> I guess so. But the thing that impressed me about it, and maybe it was smoke and mirrors now from the trailer, but what impressed me about it is how modular it was and how open to being modded it would have been. That it did seem more interesting in that sense. 
they were coming at it in the sense that, yeah, we, like, here are also mod suites for you to, you know, work into the game. The issue when developers do that is, one, it's really good because it does allow a lot of flexibility, but it also means they're kind of putting a lot of responsibility on the player base and on the community to make all the content, like Bethesda do, anyway. Moving on, uh, the free game this week on the Epic Game Store is Farming Simulator 22. I know, you were waiting for it. You've been waiting three years for Farming Simulator 22, and it's finally out. Okay, the new Farming Simulator is available. That's it. That's all I have to say about it. Take on the role of a modern farmer. Creatively build your... No, take on the role of a modern farmer. Go bankrupt and have to get a different job. Or already have three jobs plus farming. Anyway, creatively build your farm in three diverse American and European environments. How diverse are they? I don't know. There's still going to be grass. Anyway, Farming Simulator 2022. Not 20. Anyway, offers a huge variety of farming operations focusing on agriculture. Well, I imagine it would focus on agriculture, it being a farming simulator, but okay. Animal husbandry and forestry. Now with the exciting addition of seasonal cycles. Oh, I'm so, I'm so excited. Sims is open to many mods, but most people just make the adult ones. Yeah, I mean, there's a market for it. Sex sells. What do you want? Anyway, Farming Sim 22. Uh, I watched a video from People Make Games recently where they were talking about the Farming Simulator 22 eSport on how people effectively speed run making hay and then making bales and throwing the bales into the barn and it sounds dumb but it's quite fascinating. <laughs> anyway, you too can make hay bales and throw them into the barn with Farming Simulator 22. If only just added the weather, I know. <laughs> anyway. Moving on. Sanwa Saga Hellblade 2. Okay, so new releases. Those are some of the games you can play soon. What if you want to play something right now? You can, if you have an Xbox, Game Pass, or PC, you can play uh, Hellblade 2. Play might be a generous term for us, considering what I've seen from the other uh, reviews and such from it, is that, yeah, it looks really nice, but there's even less gameplay than there was in the first game. first game didn't have a ton of gameplay to it. Um, Similarly, what gameplay is there is very similar to what was in the first game. So it still has those kind of puzzles where you just have to stand in the right place and the combat is a little bit one note. But yeah, it looks really nice. Okay, you can't really take that away from them. And presentation-wise, it's it's also very good. And apparently said was really sure. Uh, I mean, I don't know if the uh, the actor is actually short, but... It's, uh, it is kind of hard. At what point do you think she's just fighting monstrous people and they're just, you know, monstrous and really tall? Or is Senwa just, you know, like Wolverine, five foot four or what? I think he's even shorter than that. Anyway, Hellblade 2, possibly a contender for multi-platform at some point, but I'd say for now, Xbox will keep it to make Game Pass a little bit more enticing. But who knows? They'll eventually get the prod from Microsoft. To say, hey, we need some of that money back. I need some of that 70 million whenever you're ready. 70 million? 70 billion. Anyway, Haunty, twin stick shooter type thing, but the twin stick shooting is more for puzzle elements. Um, you can see it's kind of presented as a monochromatic thing. We played a little bit of this during the Steam Next Fest. Um, I thought it was really impressive. Um, the kind of gist of it is you are trying to make your way up to heaven, I guess, is the idea. Um, and this person who's guiding you kind of takes you there for the most part, um, but some things happen and you get dropped all the way back down to the bottom again and now need to make your way back to the top. And you do that by possessing various things in the environment with your twin stick stuff, um, either through combat or just for general progression. For the most part, it is generally just for progression. Um, you can kind of liken it to a little bit Super Mario Odyssey in that sense, in that you take over things and those things have unique abilities, and you use those unique abilities to get around the environment. I can't believe they got rid of the people who made Hi-Fi Rush. I know, I know. It's like Tango Gameworks. We made a really good game, people really liked it. It did both critically and commercially very well, with zero marketing. You're fired. <laughs> it's like, what do you want me to do? You know? What did the people at Ninja Theory think now? Even if some, if Hellblade 2 does well, you get fired. If Hellblade 2 does poor, you get fired. Like, anyway. Anyway, Haunty out on pretty much everything, I think. I'm not sure if it's on the Switch, but I'm pretty sure it's out on everything. Be not afraid. Um, after that, Rakugaki. Rakugaki was only announced very uh, recently. 
but it did have a bit of a Gets It Radio vibe to it until we saw the gameplay, and then the gameplay has a lot more of a Crash Bandicoot vibe to it, really. Um, so it's very colorful, it does present itself in the Jet Set Radio kind of graffiti versus this kind of cyberpunk dystopia thing. Um, but the platforming elements to it do feel a little bit more Crash Bandicoot, but you do see there's like a combat element to it. Maybe Sonic Adventure is maybe a bit closer, actually. Who knows? It does still have that graffiti thing where, you know, you get to a certain point and you, you know, do your own art on top of it. That's still very Jet Set Radio. Um, I haven't seen any reviews for this, or not too many reviews, we'll say. There's no critical consensus just yet. Um, it is only out this week, and I do think that maybe it's been overshadowed by a couple of other things. Like Hellblade, probably. Anyway, I'll probably give this a look as a fully plays games a bit at some point, because it's quite colourful, and you don't see that many vibrant, colourful games. Or you do, it's called Hi-Fi Rush, and then they get fucking shut down. Anyway. Uh, Paper Trail. Paper Trail we did play as part of Steam Next Fest. It's a puzzle game where you uh, fold the environment to make uh, different uh, traversal op options. So, origami, I guess. Uh, it's top-down presentation. Uh, you fold the environment. The Every environment has both a front side and a back side to it. And you fold it in certain uh, orientations so that you can progress or reach certain things and, and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it's going to fuck with your head a lot. Like even the even the short demo was like, how the fuck do I get through this area? Uh, folding it in lots of different ways. One, uh, I suppose, one saving grace for the game, and less. I mean, obviously, it's a memory issue as well. But you can only fold it in so many ways. You know, you can't make really weird folds to the game. You know, you can fold from a corner or from a side, and that's kind of it. And don't make weird diagonal folds and stuff like. You can't turn it into a paper airplane or whatever. You don't have to worry about having to have that level of granularity to it. Still, really impressive um, and a puzzle game that really does require you to think a little bit about what you're doing. Anyway, that's out again on pretty much everything as well. Duck Detective The Secret Salami is a puzzle game. Again, we played this on Steam Next Fest again. <laughs> anyway, it's a bit like... That's uh, kind of repetitive, the paper trail thing, I guess. I suppose it depends how long it is and how you know how much it overstays its welcome. And I would think there's probably some different uh, puzzle mechanics required that when you fold things over, maybe they need to stay in place, or maybe you need to move them quickly, or I don't know. Could be a lot of different things to it. Anyway, uh, Duck Detective has a bit of Oberdin to it, a bit of Curse of the Golden Idol, um, in that it's kind of an ad libs thing. You investigate the environment and pick up these kind of puzzles, clues and stuff, and then slot them into um, like puzzle solutions. So in the same way that Oberdin would have, you know, who is this, what was their rank, and then if they died, how did they die, and if they didn't die, where are they now kind of thing. Um, the one issue I've seen with Duck Detective is that it's very short, like three hours, something like that. So that might be an issue for some people. Um, I think if it's presented well and you get a, you know, get a bit of fun out of it, that's probably not a problem. Uh, it's priced a similar way, it's like a tenner for three or four hours of fun, cute, puzzly things. Should be alright. Anyway, we are gonna play this probably next week, at least it's on the schedule for next week. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Paper Mario Thousand Year Door. So, Paper Mario Thousand Year Door remake uh, got its release this week. Reviews are glowing for it. It's apparently an extremely good uh, remake of the original game. Never played Paper Mario. Heard some very good things about it, but I never had the console to play it. Anyway, I will get around to this at some point in that same way I'll get around to Super Mario RPG at some point. Um, for those not familiar with it, Paper Mario is not like your, your standard Super Mario game. There's a lot of very strange mini games, and uh, I think there's a turn-based combat element to it as well. But again, not played it, so I'm not entirely sure myself. But a lot of very strange puzzly things also going on, not like your standard uh, Super Mario title. Anyway, moving on from that, and then finally, System Shock uh, remake has had a console release about on PC for about a year. Um, I've been waiting for this one because I did kickstart it, but I don't have a PC that could play it in all its glory, so I have been waiting for the console release for a while. And now that it is out, we will be playing it. 
Uh, we'll try to do a full let's play of this. It's one of the first immersive sims. So one of the first uh, Deus Ex, Bioshock, Elder Scrolls, you know, those kind of games where they just have a bunch of systems that interact with each other. Um, it's very well received at the time, and the remake on PC at least has been well received. So I'm kind of hoping the console port hasn't had to sacrifice too many things to make it work. But yeah, really looking forward to playing this one. Anyway, unfortunately though, it is now time to talk about the worst part of video games, the video game industry. So, big system shock open. Yeah, it looks really good. Anyway, here's the human cost of Embracer's restructuring program. So now that they're finally done with their restructuring, asterisk, citation needed, who knows if they're actually really done. Anyway, Embracer's headcount has now plummeted by 4,532 employees over the past financial year. One year, nearly 5,000 people laid off. 44 studios have been closed and 80 in-development projects have been dropped during this period. And to keep in mind the number of IPs and you know, brands and stuff that they bought up during that time, and then 80 of those games now just dropped as well. Good shit. And their CEO is still in place and hasn't been asked to step down or anything. Anyway, the company's restructuring program is now apparently successfully finalized and has created a stronger foundation for improved profitability, cash flow, and long-term value creation. The fuck does any of that mean? Anyway, restructuring began in June of last year after they spent way too much money and then Saudi Arabia didn't uh, follow through in that $2 billion partnership, so they had no money left. Anyway, the drop of nearly 5,000 employees represents a 27% reduction in the company's workforce, nearly a third company gone, a quarter of the company gone. Shit. Anyway, throughout the past year, our companies and studios have had to part ways with team members. Yes, they've had to. Definitely had to. Couldn't been maybe drop some of the C-suite or something, no? These were necessary but difficult decisions, and I don't think they were either of those. Could have just dropped your salary just a little bit has been important to carry out the changes with compassion, respect, and integrity. Fuck you. You did none of those things. Anyway, Embracer will now split into three different groups. Uh, Asmodee Group, Coffee Stain, and Friends. That's a great company. Well, who do you work for, Coffee Stain and Friends? Are you okay? Do you need help? And Middle Earth Enterprises and Friends. I wonder what they make. Anyway... Apparently, each and independently will boast sufficient scale, coherent strategies, and a clear focus. Clear focus? Who do Coffee Stain and Friends? What is their focus? Fucking making messes. Anyway, D is a really weird one because they, like, just acquired them. And now they're divesting from them again. Uh, D are, like, a board game group, effectively. Anyway, looking ahead, some games that are on the horizon for Embracer. Uh, Kingdom Come Deliverance 2, Killing Floor 3... The Disney Epic Mickey remake, uh, Hyperlight Breaker, Gothic remake, Titan Quest 2. All important releases for the next financial year with three uh, unannounced games on the way. This uh, expects to release more than 70 game projects during this financial year. Do you think maybe that's their issue? Maybe they have too many things on the go. Maybe they got too big. Way too fast. Gotta have that growth though. Gotta have that growth mindset, right? Capitalism. Thanks, Wall Street. I am excited about the future and fully convinced that the best is still <laughs> I don't know. I like, can't can it get much worse? I don't know. Anyway, a lot of people who are not convinced that the, the future that the best is still ahead of us is probably those five thousand people you let go. And the CFO that stepped down as well. But they they don't probably think the future's looking good. Anyway. Adding up those 5,000 layoffs, though, the uh, games industry layoffs surpassed 10,000 for 2024 just so far, which means 20,000 in less than 18 months. So if you combine 2023 at the same time, 20,000 layoffs in the games industry. More than 10,000 people have been laid off from their jobs this year across the video game industry. Uh, 10,500 people were laid off in 2023, meaning almost as many have been impacted just so far in 2024. So the, the best is yet to come, I guess, Lars from Embracer. 
you want to break it down by publisher, uh, Activision Blizzard, 1900, it's probably the biggest one, then Unity at 1800, PlayStation at, five, at 900, EA at around 700, and then Take Two around 600. Um, some of these are approximate, but if you break it down, that's broken down by company. Obviously, if you take it up to like parent company and stuff, Embracer he's easily wins with their 4,000 people. Anyway, Microsoft though, across all of theirs, so Xbox and Activision combined, uh, 2150, 2150 people let go. So yeah, that's a lot of people who probably have now left the industry as well, because they're going to need something a little bit more stable to pay off that mortgage and so on. Coupled with 2023, over 20,000 people have lost their jobs in the video game industry in less than 18 months. And they go on to talk about Embracer, we've already talked about that. Um, and then Chris Dring of uh, GamesIndustry.biz, who has also been laid off, we'll talk about that in a second, but they had uh, something to say about Eurogamer and the video game state of layoffs and so on. Um, so a lot of people have been let go from their jobs and getting new studios formed around them might happen, but investors are being increasingly conservative. The reality is that a lot of these artists, programmers, designers, producers, writers, and others will all have to leave the game indus uh, industry to find work and, you know, st stability, basically. Financial stability to pay off the various bills and what have you. The anger towards executive shareholders and capitalism in general is more than understandable. I think understandable is the word we're using here. It's vindictive, righteous, the rich. We're getting there. The guillotine is being dusted off, sharpened up. All right, going back to Embracer, Nintendo is taking some of its uh, crumbs. Nintendo to acquire Shiver Entertainment from Embracer Group. So Shiver are probably best known for their ports. Uh, they did ports of Hogwarts Legacy and Mortal Kombat 1 for the Switch. I think the, Ho the Hogwarts Legacy port was actually pretty good. Quite not particularly happy about the game. The port of it was allegedly good for the Switch. Um, this is pretty standard practice for Nintendo. To kind of go in with people who do work specifically for the Switch. Or anytime they've partnered with a company to make a game. A lot of the time they'll acquire the company down the road. This isn't surprising. Nintendo don't really go in for the mergers and acquisitions stuff, but when they do, it's usually for people who are already kind of doing work for them in the first place. Anyway, they'll find a lot more stability with Nintendo than they will with Embracer. Um, speaking about mergers and console wars, Atari has acquired the Intellivision brand, ending the first ever console war. Stretching all the way back to the 70s at some point. Anyway, Atari uh, buying out Intellivision. Intellivision right now had been working on the Amico console, the Tony Tallarico thing that might just be vaporware. Pretty sure it's vaporware. Anyway, the deal to acquire Intellivision does not uh, include the Amico, probably because it's not a thing and doesn't exist, but okay. Uh, the Amico brand will instead use a license from Atari so that it can release Intellivision games on top of it. That just feels like it's a money losing venture, but here we are. People are still buying it. The Intellivision, the Intelligent Television console was released by Mattel in 1979. So there you go. That's when the console wars started. The very first one, as it was going up against the Atari VCS, or the Atari 2600 as it was known uh, later on. What was VCS? Virtual Computer System. No. Every computer is virtual. I don't know. I don't know what the V was. Computer System, probably. Is CS. Anyway. Uniting Atari and a television after 45 years ends the longest running console war in history, said Sky, studio head at Digital Eclipse. The real issue here is that Atari, for the last 20 years or so, have been involved in just various pyramid schemes and NFT shit and blockchain stuff and all that kind of thing. They're not really, a, they're not the same. They're not the Atari from all the way back in 1979. And Intellivision similarly have been running scams. Really. So now there's just one big scam company, I guess. Let's put them all in the one bracket now. Uh, right, so we're on to PlayStation. PlayStation London Studio posts final goodbye as it closes its doors forever. So we did have news that London Studio was going to be shut down. Not necessarily that it was going to be shut down, it's just everybody was laid off and then nobody worked there anymore. So, de facto, <laughs> guess it's shut down anyway. For over 20 years, London Studio has been home to some exceptionally talented and wonderful people in the game industry. 20 years. Probably one of Sony's longest running studios at that point. Did a lot of 
their R&D, did a lot of support work, and did a lot of just niche stuff for Sony's peripherals that then they forgot about. Or decided, hey, we made a game, and whoever was involved in that project got a promotion, and now they don't care about it anymore. Anyway, as we close the doors and all go forward to new adventures, we wanted to say a heartfelt thank you to all our past and present players, and colleagues who have supported us over the years. We've had one wild journey, wild and wonderful journey. Uh, it was accompanied by this picture that kind of depicts some of the games that they've worked on. For Blood and Truth, uh, Singstar, Eye Toy Games, the Hogwarts thing, or the Harry Potter thing rather. Uh, various football practices, there's a VR game where you're down with a shark. There's Lair that we should probably not talk about <laughs> that game was not very good. Anyway, as I said, London Studio is very much their experimental thing. And since Sony is not experimenting at all anymore and just making the same game and putting a different name on it. I guess there's really no room for them anymore. Earlier this year, Sony announced it was laying off 900 people, equating to 8% of its workforce. London Studio was working on an online game for the PlayStation 5. You may recall Jim Ryan's big push to get everything being online and live service thing. Basically every studio was working on a live service game. How many of them are still doing that? We don't know. Hopefully not many. Anyway, in 2022, uh, co-heads Stuart White and Tara Saunders had more to say about their most ambitious project to date, saying uh, it's an exciting future, it really is. And now they're gone. Good shit. Anyway, speaking of PlayStation, Neil Druckmann decided to talk, and now everybody has to hear what he has to say. Last of Us director says AI will push the boundaries of storytelling in games. Thanks, Neil. Can you go back into the swamp so we don't have to hear it from you ever again? So these are based on statements he made in an internal interview with Sony. Keep that in mind. That'll come up. That'll be important later. Uh, there's a ton of AI apologia in his interview. Uh, the PlayStation Company is rolling out a big campaign about the future of technology in video games. There was a big push from Sony, the parent, like the big parent company, talking about technology innovation and what they're going to be bringing to just tech in general, not just video games. Sony do other things. You know, they make camera lenses and that's kind of it. <laughs> I mean, they make TVs and, and headphones and what else have you, but the ca their camera lenses is probably their biggest thing. Anyway, PlayStation Company is rolling out a big campaign and uh, Druckmann spends chunks of the interview hyping up AI technology as a cost-cutting measure. That's what I want for my creatives, thinking about cost-cutting measures. Not thinking about creativity, just how they can reduce costs. He's a creative director, not a uh, Chief Financial Officer, but okay. Anyway, he's talking about, you know, narrative and what have you. He passively mentions ethical issues and then says nothing afterwards. Of course, I wouldn't imagine Neil Druckmann will want to talk about ethical issues considering all of the ethical issues that come with his development practices. Google AI is telling people that when you are depressed, the solution is jump off a bridge. Okay, <laughs> that's true. It's also telling you if you want to make the best pizza to use glue, and if you want to pass a kidney stone, you should drink a lot of piss. Good stuff. AI is going to save the future, everybody. He says that as long as one can precisely direct AI tools, you can't. The way generative AI works is you can't direct it at all. You can't even reproduce. Put in the same prompt, you won't even get the same answer. They could be used to create nuanced dialogues and characters. No. No, they can't. <laughs> anyway. And then, uh, kind of editorial here from Kenneth Shepard is, uh, we're the beloved characters and, uh, we're the beloved ones you and your team created with their hearts and minds and skills not good enough. It's like, you guys already do this. I've already been recognized, and I'm not a huge fan of The Last of Us story, but I would still appreciate it's well written. You know? It has been recognized to have been well written, well fleshed out, a good story, though I don't agree, but... For the most part, people think it is. You're already doing this. You don't need it. You don't need AI. It'll make it worse. Anyway, there's more of that shit. Uh, to hear the man behind um, The Last of Us advocate for AI as a means to write characters and dialogue rather than standing up for the human element that brought your studio so much prestige under brutal working conditions and is that ethics issue that Neil doesn't want to talk about is clown shit. Uh, irresponsible even. Very much so. Anyway, Going back to that whole being a Sony in-house uh, interview thing, uh, the problem with that is that means they can edit it whatever way they want. 
Neil Druckmann sets the record straight on what he actually said about Naughty Dog's next game. So in that interview, outside of the AI stuff, he was talking about what the next game from uh, Naughty Dog would be, and he was quoted as having said, it could redefine mainstream perceptions of gaming. Now, apparently, that's not what he said. Neil Druckmann now says he never actually said that. Uh, the quote went viral on social media and received widespread criticism on him talking about redefining mainstream perceptions and so on because it was very highfalutin and up your own ass and smelling your own farts. Which is why everyone assumed he did say that because that's Neil Druckmann. Anyway, that is not quite what I said. Of course, he had to be very careful about what he said about this because, you know, Sony pays him. <laughs> Big Daddy Sony, don't, uh, you know, don't tell them that they're full of shit. Anyway, uh, he talks about how gaming used to be a very niche and siloed off from the rest of the culture. Um, that was just nerd stuff in general now, like comic books and action figures and all that kind of stuff. Video games, what have you. Card games, etc. were all niche and now they make a lot of money. So now everyone wants to get in on it. Anyway... I'm very excited to see what the... So what he said about it, it wasn't that uh, the game could redefine mainstream perceptions of gaming. What he actually said was he was very excited to see what the reaction to the game would be. That's, that's a lot of changes. That's a huge change. <laughs> like Some of the words aren't even the same. That's sending the interview through a bunch of middlemen who all have to agree on it. They all tweaked it to say such and such. But when you're quoting somebody, you gotta quote them. You're not paraphrasing them. You can paraphrase them fine, but if you're saying it's a direct quote, it's a quote, so you gotta say what they actually said. Anyway, this will come up in a second because of what our next story is, but anyway. Sony's website made a surprising number of cuts, and what's worse, made up a bunch of things Druckmann didn't actually say. Now, of course, it raises the question of how many other parts of the interview aren't actually accurate paraphrases. Presumably, if there were more errors, Druckmann would have corrected those as well, so the stuff about AI like he did say that because he didn't correct it in any way whatsoever. One thing that Sony did cut from his bronze though was one very brief, very rare moment of humility from him. I've been very lucky to have worked on my favorite games with incredible collaborators and I'm very thankful for them. So, I mean, he did, at least he did say that. He's thankful enough that he makes them crunch themselves into oblivion, but okay. Anyway, having internal corporate driven interviews aren't great. Considering this next story, which is IGN Entertainment has acquired Eurogamer, Games Industry, Video Games 24-7, Rock Paper Shotgun, and more, as they've effectively bought out the Gamer Network portfolio. Yeah, that's a big... homogenization of the video game industry journalism side of things. So that's not good. So IGN Entertainment, who collectively make up uh, IGN, sure you're well aware of, Map Genie, How Long to Beat, and Humble Bundle, as well as a bunch of other things. That's all IGN, that's Ziff Davis. They're already a very large octopus of video game adjacent things. Uh, have now about, uh, bought out uh, the Gamer Network portfolio, which includes gamesindustry.biz, we're reading the story right now, Eurogamer, including the various local languages, so there's Eurogamer Spain, Eurogamer so. Eurogamer France and so on. Uh, Rock Paper Shotgun, which focuses mostly on PC stuff. Video Game 24 7. I'm not really sure what that is necessarily. It's, it feels like it's very much an in between Eurogamer and Rock Paper Shotgun kind of thing. And Dicebreaker, that focuses mostly on board games. The business also holds shares in Outside Xbox, uh, Digital Foundry, and Hookshot. So Outside Xbox is like a, a video equivalent of. Really, a video coming of Eurogamer. I suppose Eurogamer has their own YouTube channel. Outside Xbox is more of a friendlier version of it. Digital Foundry is a very tech focused thing. They do a lot of like benchmarking of new games and stuff like that. And Hookshot, I don't know what that is. Right, it's Nintendo Life, Push Square, Pure Race. Okay, so it's even more uh, journalism outlets. So yeah, they're all being taken in-house, and of course there were a ton of redundancies because of it. As a result of the acquisition, some redundancies have been made across the UK-based organisation, including various members of GamesIndustry.biz. It's rather telling that they weren't allowed to say that on the article itself. Anyway, this isn't great because, as you've probably noticed, I get a lot of my news from a lot of <laughs> a lot of these outlets, and they're about to lose a lot of people. Disgusting! Disgusting? <laughs> It's not great. It's not great. 
<sighs> anyway, we'll know more about that as, you know, uh, the fallout from various redundancies and then merging of various things. Are we going to get an IGN Europe at some point that takes over Eurogamer or that kind of thing? We'll see how that works out. Anyway, I'm gonna leave... I'll leave Senwa to play in the background, I guess. Probably the biggest release this week. Anyway, that's the news for uh, 20th to the 26th of May 2024. So some more things from uh, Elden Ring Shadow of the Erd Tree, some lore things. It's really more just set up. We won't really know the full implications of that until, well, until Vati Vidya has put out his YouTube video about it. Let's, let's be honest, that's what everyone's waiting for. Um, some interesting things coming out of the latest indie showcase. A lot of it is kind of bad news because a lot of the games have been delayed into the later half of the year. Um, not wanting to come out in the middle of summer, I guess. Or nobody wants to come out in the shadow of Shadow of the Earth Tree, possibly. Anyway, um, Kingdom Hearts now, for the most part, is all in one place. Minus one game that nobody can play and Melodies of Memories, which is, I guess is too new. Um, still must still be under Epic Games uh, exclusivity or something. Um, Life by You delayed again. This time we have no idea when it's coming out, but there's still other games in the Life Sim stuff. Paralives is still on the way. It's good for The Sims to get any kind of competition, even if the competition isn't necessarily strong. Any competition at all would be good for The Sims because it's just going, hey, nobody else makes these games, so we can just do whatever we want. 20 euro for a dog? Yeah, that's it. That's never coming down in price. You know it. You know, they do need some competition, at least. Get in there. Anyway. Uh, new games out. You can see Hellblade 2 is playing in the background there. Um, System Shock console release. It's good, because we will be playing that at some point uh, soon. Probably whenever Final Fantasy VI wraps up. They finally, are fired a <laughs> they finally had to hire a team to fix bugs. I know. Uh, I did see that news as well. <laughs> that they're going to look at stabilizing the sims they haven't had to you're gonna it's like fuck you you want to play this game we're the only people that make it <laughs> fuck you you'll buy it pretty much That's the way they've been coming at it everyone else has been saying no i'm just gonna pirate it actually you instead ea uh games industry news obviously not great we've now seen the full brunt of embracers restructuring program which had 5,000 people laid off and none of them in the C-suite or the E-suite? Of course not. That would be ridiculous. Why would we get rid of those people who are responsible for this? No? No, we couldn't possibly do that. 10,000 people gone just this year, 20,000 if you factor in last year. A lot of them won't be able to like start their own studios or move to a new studio or any of that kind of thing. They're just going to be gone from the industry. So it's a lot of just knowledge and experience how to make a good game just gone from the industry so yeah that's that's good that's great glad i'm glad that's happening and then news of ign effectively taking over the rest of video game journalism the only thing that's really left now is i don't know kotaku and uh the bunch of worker-led groups that are kind of relying on Patreon, effectively. How long they can last for, we don't know. Not a good day. It's not a good day for the, the video game news side of things. Anyway, <laughs> moving on from that, that's your news, but what is happening on the channel? So, on the channel, we are doing this. So here's our, our big wallow games uh, for 2024. Uh, some games now finished. So we finished Indica this week. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Final Fantasy V is still ongoing. Uh, I didn't get a chance to play it yesterday because we did have uh, some people over and I couldn't really get away. Um, Duck Detective, as we said, has now been released. So that is now available to be played as well as Lorelei and the Laser Eyes and a few other things. Let's move on to the fun part, I guess so. Anyway. So, off stream, um, I've been playing Crime O'Clock and I've now finished it. Uh, Crime O'Clock is a find the hidden object kind of thing, detective thing, uh, as you're kind of tracking the progress of various crimes throughout history. Um, the way the game is done is it's like a one big, you know, dense, densely drawn thing. 
um, and you have ten time stamps across time, um, and you're kind of tracking somebody's position. So it's like find this character, basically, the whole thing, or find something, whatever it is. Um, and I quite liked it. I did feel it went on a little bit too long, and the gimmick kind of wore thin about halfway through, and then there was still a solid two hours or so of the game left. So it was like, okay, I can't, I, can't get, I get the gist of it. And also, I cannot find this fucking thing, okay? Help me out here. And the clues are just not good enough. <laughs> They're just not good enough. I'm like, oh, fuck. I'm going to have to look this up then. Lots of screen. It's funny that the walkthrough is just screenshots of the thing with a red circle. It's like, click that, click that, click that. Anyway, yeah. I think it went on a little bit too long, but otherwise it was enjoyable. Uh, moving on. Nope. Pretend you didn't see that. Moving on. <laughs> you saw nothing. Uh, so I finished Crime O'Clock, so now I'm playing Tales of Gonzero Zhao, which is a Metroidvania that has a bit of a... Well, not a bit of an African vibe to it, has a considerable African vibe to it. Um... It's enjoyable. Having come straight out of Prince of Persia with the Lost Crown, though, it is, it's not as good. Not even close. Um, but it's still enjoyable. It's still kind of fun. Yeah, I don't know. I think I was spoiled by Prince of Persia with the Lost Crown, basically. It's kind of the issue. It's I get the same feeling when I go back to Roguelikes now after having played Hades, and I'm like, eh, yeah, it's good, but it's not Hades. <laughs> it's not Hades good. Anyway, I'm still continuing with it. I'm still pretty early into it. I haven't even fought the first boss or anything. So, I don't know. It might open up after that. Moving on, uh, Indica, as I said, we did play this week, uh, it's a little bit shorter than I thought it was, I thought it was a 5-6 to six hour game, and it was more of a 4-5 to five hour thing, so the second stream was quite short. But anyway, Indica, you play Indica, Nun, who is, uh, believes she's possessed by the devil, uh, she's thrown out of the convent because the nuns just don't like her, basically, uh, with the... She's tasked with taking a letter to a local monastery, but she reads the letter along the way and finds that the letter just says she's been defrocked. Um, and now she's kind of trying to regain her, her faith and, and so on. Uh, she finds that there is a relic that is visiting a local cathedral, and she thinks maybe that can help her remove the devil from her possession and so on. But really, it's more of a story of your crisis of faith and living in... 18th century Russia and this kind of stuff. Um, I thought it was really good. It's really well written. Characters are really good. It's not... Uh, what can we say? It's not a fun game. It's quite grim, but I thought it was very good. <laughs> I would throw someone out if they said they were possessed. I guess. It's, it's not clear if she really is possessed by the devil or if she's, you know, just experiencing psychosis or whatever. But the game is somewhat fantastical, so she could well be possessed by the devil. Anyway, moving on to next week. So, schedule for next week. Duck Detective The Secret Salam, we've already seen, it was released this week. It's the thing with the duck that's like a cutout thing where he walks around and off. Anyway, we're going to be playing that. That's a short game. We'll probably do it in one stream. Uh, so, on top of that, then, Lorelei and the Laser Eyes is what we're planning to play uh, after that. This is from Simogo, the people behind Sayonara Wild Hearts. Um, Sayonara Wild Hearts was more of a rhythm action thing, and Lower Line the Laser Eyes is not that. It's not that at all. It's a puzzle thing. It's kind of presented like survival horror, but I don't think there actually is a survival element to it. I think it's just really weird, trippy shit, and then there's some puzzles thrown in. Um, but all of the reviews for it are like in the high 80s, low 90s. I'm like, okay, it must be good then. <laughs> we'll give it a look. Um, Sayonara Wild Heart similarly has a similar, um, uh, critical reception, and I didn't get it. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's fun, but it's not, like, game of the year worthy kind of stuff. Like, anyway, we'll see. Uh, with Lower Line, the Laser Eyes. I'm planning full let's play of it, but we'll see what the game itself is like and how much I'm enjoying it. If I am enjoying it at all, it might just be a, a one-shot. We'll see. Anyway. Even more reason to throw them. <laughs> I don't know if they're just psychotic. Anyway. Uh, no, wait, that's a walkthrough. I don't want to see that. Okay, right, schedule. 
schedule for next week, as I said, uh, Duck Detective Secret Salami. It's a pretty short game. It's like three, maybe four hours um, if you decide to just talk to everybody. But that's a pretty standard stream for me. It's three hours, three and a half hours or so. So we'll probably get that done in one stream. Uh, so Wednesday, Lower Line, The Laser Eyes, as I said, we'll take a look at it. And if I'm liking it, we'll turn it into a full let's play. If I'm not, we'll leave it as a one shot. Um, and then continuing Final Fantasy V, we're only really approaching the halfway point. Final Fantasy V. We're, we're more like a third of the way through it at the moment, so it's quite a bit longer than the other Final Fantasy we've played up to this point. Um, so we've probably still got like another four, maybe five streams left of that. Or we'll move on to something else. Um, but I do plan to do System Shock at some point. Um, and I would like to also go back to the Resident Evil series playthrough, because we don't want to go too heavy into Final Fantasy. Um, so Resi 5 would be next, which is the co-op one, the very first co-op game. Anyway, that's it for me. So next week, Duck Detective Tuesday, Loreline the Laser Eyes, Wednesday, Final Fantasy V on Thursday and Saturday. There won't be stream on Friday as I have D&D thing. Um, and then Sunday, we'll be back around to the weekly news recap, which is the one you're watching right now. All right, that's your news and your channel update for the 20th to 26th of May, 2024. That's it from me. Uh, for today, I'll be back on Tuesday with Secret Salamis. And that's not a euphemism. It really is the, the, the sausage. Also not a euphemism. Anyway, I'm going to go before I incriminate myself further. Um, good to see... Is it Doom Train Inc? Is, is under Tim... A bunch of numbers, a bunch of letters. I can't read that properly. Um, I'm Elwin. Always, always a pleasure. Uh, and anyone lurking in the background also. Good stuff. Um, if you want to catch up on any of those Let's Plays that I mentioned, you can find those over on YouTube, youtube.com slash doomtrain5, or slash at doomtrain5, depending on how YouTube is behaving for you that day. And um, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, twitch.tv slash doomtrain5 is where you can watch uh, Minty. Oh, hey, okay, Minty. TV Mint. TV Mint Mint. Mint TV. Got it. <laughs> Delicious. Right. Uh, okay, I'm going to go, because... I'm getting delirious. Have a good one, everybody, and I'll talk to you Tuesday. Oh boy. Mm -hmm.